Welcome to National Community Church Online. My name is Jenny Clayville and I'm the campus pastor for our Boston location. And on behalf of NCC, we miss you so much. Nothing replaces in-person human interaction, but I'm so glad that we have the technology not only to worship together online, but to stay in touch. Right now, more than ever, we need to make sure we stay connected. So go to ncc.re slash connect and let us know how you're doing. As a Christ follower, one of our greatest privileges is giving. It's an act of worship, the overflow of a grateful heart. And we believe that our God is an irrationally generous God. And one way we reflect Him is by being generous ourselves. So please go to ncc.re slash giving to help us reach beyond the four walls of our homes and church buildings, especially right now when there are so many needs with COVID-19. Thank you in advance for helping us serve and lead others to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Before you get settled in, we'll be taking communion today. So go ahead and start preparing those elements with whatever you have at home. Also, this weekend is Mother's Day. So to all the mamas out there, happy Mother's Day to you. As a boy mom of two amazing creatures, I love highlighting our relationship in a special way on this day every year. But this day also reminds me I'm still grieving a not quite restored and extremely broken relationship of my own with my own mother. And I know I'm not alone. There's a story sitting on the other side of every single screen watching right now. And this weekend is a mixed bag for many of us. So if you'd allow me a minute to just bless you. To those who gave birth this year with their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who experienced loss through miscarriage or failed adoptions, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. And to those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prod, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. And to those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who have lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who are single and long to have children of your own, we love you and believe God is using you in ways you don't even realize. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on those complex paths. To those who have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we, we grieve and rejoice with you. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We love you. Together now, let's bring it to the foot of his throne in worship. The 60-second countdown is about to start, but before I let you go, remember, don't just be a viewer. Participate. Worship loud and proud, and remember, the best is yet to come.
feeling in my bones you're about to move I feel it in the wind you're about to ride in you said that you would pour your spirit out you said that you would fall on sons and daughters
Ten years ago, I flew to Peru and hiked the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu with my son Parker. Epic adventure. One of the hardest hikes I've done simply because of the elevation. As we trek through Dead Woman's Pass, I get this throbbing headache because of oxygen deprivation. At 14,000 feet, the atmosphere has 37% less oxygen. That's when our guide pulls out a can of pure oxygen and I inhaled a few times. As I breathed in that pure oxygen, headache was gone in a matter of minutes. Can I tell you what I'm believing for? This is not a message, this is a prayer that I've been praying for you. I'm asking God to open a can of pure oxygen and fill your lungs and fill your life with the Holy Spirit. I'm praying that God would heal a few headaches. Would you pray a simple prayer right now? It's only three words, but it has the potential to revolutionize your life. Here it is. Come, Holy Spirit. If you pray it and mean it, it's game on. Right now, uh, wherever you are, I want you to take a deep breath and let it out. When you take a deep breath, it has a biological effect. It promotes blood flow to the rest of the body. It also has a physiological effect. It calms nerves. It alleviates anxiety. It enhances attention span and it relieves pain. This is who the Holy Spirit is. This is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit calms our nerves. This is where our holy confidence comes from. The Holy Spirit alleviates anxiety. He is the peace that passes understanding. The Holy Spirit enhances attention span way beyond what we could ask or imagine. And the Holy Spirit relieves pain. He is our counselor. He is our comforter. He is an ever-present help in time of need. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And by the way, long before you woke up this morning, long after you go to sleep tonight, Spirit of God is interceding for you with groanings that can't even be formulated into words. Now, come on, that ought to relieve a headache or two. This weekend, we venture into the Valley of Dry Bones. If you have a Bible, you can meet me in Ezekiel 37. Let me set the scene. The book of Ezekiel, written around 571 BC, written to Jewish refugees in Babylon, a few years before the Babylonians had conquered the city of Jerusalem, pilfered the temple, and profaned everything that the Jewish people called holy. Ezekiel is writing to these prisoners of war who feel like God abandoned them. And I get it, I've been there. But here's the irony. When we feel like God has turned his back on us, sometimes it's because we have turned our back on God. We go our own way and then we wonder where God went. God didn't go anywhere. His goodness and mercy is following you all the days of your life. And if you would turn around, you would find God with his arms wide open. Long story short, the Jewish people, had profaned God with their idolatry long before Nebuchadnezzar pilfered the temple. This is when God sends them an eccentric prophet named Ezekiel. Now I say eccentric because he once preached a sermon by lying on his left side for 390 days and you thought my sermons were long. Ezekiel, one of the major prophets, one of the latter prophets, and I'll be honest, first 24 chapters, tough read. 
Ezekiel is rebuking the Jewish people, but, but I will say this. We don't need false prophets who say what our itching ears want to hear. The people I appreciate and respect are the people who say what needs to be said. They care enough to confront. They speak the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, but they speak the truth in love, and that's key. By the way, the more you care about what people think about you, the less able you are to love them, the less you care about what people think about you, the more you're able to love them. I hope that makes sense. About halfway through the book, it's almost like Ezekiel flips the script. His name literally means God strengthens and he lives up to his name. He starts speaking life and love and hope and help. And that's where we pick up the story in Ezekiel 37. Now let me back up the bus just a little bit, and I wanna give us an on-ramp to the Valley of Dry Bones. Now for what it's worth, the Bible wasn't divided into chapters and verses until the 16th century. It was a French printer and scholar named Robert Esteen who thought it would be a lot easier to navigate the Bible if it was broken into chapters and verses. Totally agree, plus, made John 3.16 signs possible. Now that said, sometimes those chapter divisions create a false construct. We compartmentalize in ways that the original writers never intended. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show yourself approved to God. How? Rightly dividing the word of truth. All of that to say this, I'm grateful for chapters and verses but let's not create partitions in the text that weren't intended to be there. So, we'll get to the Valley of Dry Bones, but I want to begin in the mountains in chapter 36. The Lord says to Ezekiel, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. He says this several times. Now, let me state the obvious. God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to an inanimate object. Now, generally speaking, people who talk to inanimate objects sit by themselves. Not a whole lot of friends, right? Not normal. Normal is overrated. At some point in your life, if you're gonna break the bad habit, if you're gonna overcome the addiction, if you're gonna achieve the goal, if you're gonna restore the relationship, if you're gonna solve the problem, at some point, you have to stop talking to God about the mountains in your life and start talking to the mountains about God. You have to prophesy His promises, His power, His love, His grace, His truth. Jesus said it this way, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Faith turns mountains into molehills. On July 2nd, 2016, we were in a series called Mountains Move. We were putting this principle into practice and I felt prompted to pray a brave prayer. Now, I had prayed it hundreds of times before, but I felt like I needed to pray it again. I asked God to heal my asthma and something unbelievable happened. God healed my asthma. I had asthma for 40 years. I slept with an inhaler under my pillow. I played basketball with an inhaler in my sock. There weren't 40 days in 40 years that I didn't take multiple puffs of my rescue inhaler. Now, I won't get into the details, but at some point, enough is enough. I spoke to the asthma, and the asthma went away. I'm 1,408 days asthma-free, inhaler-free. Now, I want to be careful right here. This is not name it, claim it. Uh, we don't get God on our terms, on our timeline. Every prayer has to uh, pass a two-fold litmus test, has to be in the will of God and for the glory of God. But there does come a moment when enough is enough, when you've got to activate faith and speak to the mountain in your life. I love this story in the Gospels. When a storm hits the Sea of Galilee and the disciples are scared to death, which is saying something because they were professional fishermen, spent half of their life on the open seas, what does Jesus do? He stands up in the boat, which uh, had to be a balancing act to begin with, and he rebukes the storm with three words, peace, be still. The disciples have seen him do so many miracles, but sometimes it's hardest to believe God in an area of our expertise. Why? 
It's the place where we're self-sufficient. It's the place where we think we have it figured out, where we think we have it under control. The more you know, sometimes the harder it is to unlearn some of those assumptions. I think for the disciples, that was the Sea of Galilee. For the disciples, this is the jaw drop moment. I love what they say. Even the wind and the waves obey him. In Christ, you can tell mountains to move. In Christ, you can tell storms to be still. You have that kind of authority. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Again, got to be in the will of God and for the glory of God, but if it is, game on. 14 years ago, we prophesied to a crack house and it became Ebenezer's Coffee House. Three years ago, we prophesied to an abandoned apartment building and it became the DC Dream Center. We prophesied to inanimate objects, to brick and mortar, to dilapidated pieces of property. And look what the Lord has done. Is there a mountain that needs to move? Is there a storm that needs to be stilled? Would you pray a brave prayer right now? All right, verse eight says, but you, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel. God promises fruitfulness where there was barrenness. Now let me say this, if you want God to do the super, you have to do the natural. I think one of the most fascinating miracles in the gospels is Jesus cursing the barren fig tree. Every other miracle brings life. This miracle brings death. What is a barren fig tree? It's anything that isn't producing fruit. I think all of us have discovered some barren fig trees during this COVID-19 crisis. There are some things that you've put down that you need not pick back up. You've got to curse the barren fig tree. You have to participate in the miracle. Now, this promise in Ezekiel reminds me of the prophet Joel. He said, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have stolen. Reminds me of the prophet Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. Reminds me of the prophet Zephaniah who said, for every trouble, I will render double. Now, I love those promises, but let me interrupt this regularly scheduled sermon with a lesson in hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, science of interpreting scripture, and the most basic principle may be this one. Text without context is pretext. Well, what does that mean? It means that these books were written, these promises were given to very specific people in very specific situations. We don't get to pick and choose God's promises like pin the tail on the donkey. We have to carefully consider the original context, historical, geographical, cultural. That is part and parcel of rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, having said that, I will say this, let's not pin the tail on the donkey, but let's connect the dots. Second Corinthians 1.20, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Estimates range from 3,573 to 5,467 promises. Honestly, it doesn't matter how many, why? Because all of those promises are yes in Christ. But the verse doesn't end there. It says, through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. You have to add the amen. How? By exercising your faith. How? By telling mountains to move, by telling the storm to be still, by telling water to turn into wine, by telling Lazarus to come forth. In math, this would be called the transitive property. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. The C in this equation is Christ. In Christ, we are grafted into covenant relationship with God and we gain access to all of the promises that go with it. Let me give you an Old Testament example. Joshua 1.3 says, uh, I will give you everywhere you set your foot. In August of 1996, I'm reading that verse and the Holy Spirit quickens that verse to my spirit. I feel this prompting to pray a perimeter all the way around Capitol Hill. Now, I wasn't praying for property. I was praying for people. Uh, here we are more than two decades later and we own half a dozen properties on that prayer circle, including a city block that is now our Capitol Hill campus. That is not coincidence. That is 
providence, we bound on earth what was bound in heaven. Now, I know some people would say, Mark, that promise wasn't for you. It was for Joshua. I get that. But the promise wasn't actually for Joshua. It was for Moses. God says, just as I promised Moses. So it's the transitive property at play. We've got to be careful. But I don't think our issue is over believing the promises of God. I think it's under believing the God who watches over his word to perform it. Jeremiah 1.12. Is there a promise you need to stand on or kneel on or add the amen to? Would you pray a brave prayer? All right, with that as a backdrop, I want us to venture into this valley of dry bones. Verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Verse 3. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, only you know. He said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel has already prophesied to the mountains. Now he prophesies to dead bones. Now I'm not sure which is more impossible. Mountains are huge. Dead bones are dead. Question, what does he prophesy? He prophesies the word of the Lord. This is so critical. I'm filming this message in my office right above Ebenezer's Coffee House. And occasionally we'll have customers come in and ask about the bookstore upstairs. Not a bookstore, just my office with a few thousand of my best friends. I love books, but there is a difference between these books and the book. These books are dead trees. The book, the Bible, is living and active. Hebrews 4.16, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You don't just read the Bible. The Bible reads you. The same spirit that inspired the original writers inspires us as readers. How? Psalm 119, 25, the psalmist says, quicken me according to thy word. That's what happened the day that I read Joshua 1, 3. Now that word quicken in the Hebrew language means to catalyze as in chemistry. It means to take possession as in deed of transfer. It means to sustain life as in ventilator. It means to conceive as in, well, we'll leave that one there. Finally, it can mean mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. When the Spirit quickens, it brings dead things back to life. As we read and pray and meditate on God's Word, God resurrects us. He does surgery on our souls. Verse 5, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. There is this shaking and trembling and rattling as these bones come together. Flesh comes upon them. Skin covers them. But there is still no breath in them. Then the Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these dry bones. This is a flashback to the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God breathes into the dust. Adam becomes a living being. It's the Hebrew word ruach. It can be translated breath or spirit or both. Bottom line, in him we live and move and have our being. After God healed my asthma, I started researching anything and everything related to respiration. Not sure how this theory uh, eluded me through three seminary degrees, but it forever changed the way I think about the 23,000 breaths we take every day. In Judaism, the name of God was too sacred to be pronounced. In fact, it was spelled without the vowels. That part I knew. What I didn't know is that some Hebrew scholars believe that the name of God Yahweh without the vowels is synonymous with the sound of breathing. If that's true, then the name of God is too sacred to be pronounced, but it's actually whispered 23,000 times 
every single day. It's our first word, our last word, and every word in between. Verse 12, thus says the Lord, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of them. In verse 5, there's a flashback to creation. Verse 12 is a flash forward to the resurrection. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus speaking to dead bones and saying, Lazarus, come forth. It's a picture of what Jesus does in each one of us. Over time, pieces of our personality die. So do our dreams. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Would you receive that life today? It's as simple as accepting the invitation Jesus extended 2,000 years ago. He said, follow me. If you turn around, you're going to find the Heavenly Father with His arms wide open. Would you turn around today? If that's you, if you're at our online campus, would you just raise your hand? Uh, you'll see a little button right there. We want to help you take that next step in your spiritual journey. You'll see a link, ncc.re slash follow Jesus. Let me close with this. In Numbers 11, Moses sets up the tent of meeting outside the camp. He gathers 70 elders and God says, I'm going to take the spirit that's on you and put it on them. And when he does, it's like the day of Pentecost. These elders start prophesying the praises of God. And there's this subplot to the story that I think is a picture of what God is doing right now. Two men remain in the camp, Eldad and Medad, and there are differing opinions on why they stayed in the camp. One rabbinic tradition says that they did not consider themselves worthy. Whatever the reason, they stayed in the camp. They were physically distanced. They were sheltered in place. Guess what? That doesn't keep the Holy Spirit from falling on them like he did the 78, and they start prophesying in the camp in their own tent. Here's what I find fascinating about this story. God sets up a structure, sets up a system. It's called the tent of meeting. We call it the church. He instructs the elders to gather at the tent outside the camp. Then God moves outside the system, outside the structure that he himself set up. We need systems. We need structures. But we dare not box God in by boxing God in out. Listen, God can move in an upper room. God can move in your room right now, right where you are. The Spirit of God can show up anywhere, anytime, anyhow. All you have to do is say, come, Holy Spirit. Would you invite him right now? Now, here's the irony of this story. Joshua actually tries to shut it down. Eldad and Medad don't have credentials. They aren't ordained. They can't celebrate communion at home. They can't baptize their own kids. They can't lead their family in prayer. That's Moses' job. No, God turns the whole thing inside out and upside down. Maybe God is doing it all over again. We often benedict by saying when you leave this place, you don't leave the presence of God. You take the presence of God with you wherever you go. Do you believe that? or not. The text explicitly says that Joshua was the minister of Moses. I think he's trying to protect his turf, protect his territory. Moses says, are you envious for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you do. You are a prophet. The Jewish rabbis didn't believe that the prophetic gifting was reserved for a select few. They believed it was for everybody. In fact, they believed it was evidence of spiritual maturity. The more you grow, the more prophetic you become. 1 Corinthians 14 says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Love plus prophecy equals game on. That's when and how and where God's kingdom is going to come. That's when and where and how God's will is going to be done. You are the only Bible some people will ever read, but I'm going to take it a step further. You are the only prophet that some people will ever encounter. What is a prophet? 
It's just someone in whom the Spirit of God is working and speaking and sealing and healing and revealing and convicting and comforting. It's someone who speaks words of strengthening, comforting, and encouragement with the Holy Spirit's help. The Holy Spirit wants to breathe on you right now. The Holy Spirit wants to breathe in you right now. But the Holy Spirit also wants to breathe through you. In John 20, 20, Jesus breathes on his disciples and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Would you let him breathe on you and in you and through you? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there you are. And there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be a fun surprise uh, for NCC to have you come and celebrate communion with us. And so, Dick, I just finished preaching uh, about the Valley of Dry Bones, not it old bones. Not old bones. Just dry bones. Is there anything personal in that? Because my bones, I understand that bones replenish and renew themselves every seven years. And I'm just in the first year of a new cycle. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> we were on the phone earlier this week and you told me a story about a very unique communion. I thought it would be fun if you shared that story with NCC. Sure. Sort of the, lar the large framework. I'll try to do this in just a minute. Uh, in 1956, five uh, missionaries went to a tribal group called the Alcas at the time, the Warani now, that are in the Amazon basin of eastern Ecuador. Uh, all married, young guys, um, with most of them with children, and they went into this area, flew in. They had made contact with this tribe uh, a number of times by airdrop gifts. They actually landed the plane, spent some time, spent a day and a half, and then the young party of younger guys attacked them and killed them all, speared them to death on a Sunday afternoon, uh, I think January 9th or 10th, 1956. And so there are all kinds of stories that came out of that, all kinds of 
books that were written. Long story short, in 1999, uh, I walked into Congressman Frank Wolf's office on Capitol Hill, and he said, Dick, uh, a fellow came here with an Indian gentleman, an, an, uh, sort of an indigenous person from the Ecuador, and they wanted us to come down and try to help with the with some issues they have with oil companies. And uh, they wanted me to send a staffer and I told them I wouldn't. If anybody would go, I would. Do you wanna go with me? And the young man who had come, actually a businessman from Florida uh, in his late 40s, fellow by the name of Steve Saint. His father was the pilot of the plane, Nate Saint, and, uh, and he was killed with the other five. Uh, since that time, he had gone back into the tribe with his family, et cetera they had been adopted and vice versa. So long story short, Frank and I got on American Airlines, flew to Quito Missionary Aviation Fellowship, flew us in and we landed there, walked a mile through dense rainforest to this village. And that night we sat around, um, we were sitting around and the sun went down and on the equator when the sun goes down, it's just instant, just boom. And uh, they brought out a candle and stuck it in the mound of dirt and uh, one candle, you know, this will preach, one candle in pitch black can shed a lot of light. So you have night birds calling and jungle creatures. And one of the, one of the tribal people um, taught us from the scriptures because after the young men were killed, one of the wives, Elizabeth Elliot, and the sister of Nate St. Rachel went back in. Elizabeth took her three-year-old daughter and they spent time with them. Rachel spent her whole life there and the people started following Jesus. And one of the killers, one of the, he was a teenage guy by the name of Minkai. He was part of the group, he had come to faith and uh, he was with us. So we're sitting around listening to the teaching and um, uh, Steve leaned over to me and said, Dick, do you think we could have communion? And I said, well, sure. He said, they don't have it very often out here. I said, do you have the elements? He said, well, we have a little cake that was just baked by the ladies, a little muffin-like. Thing. And uh, we have a, a tin cup and we have orange tang. You think that would work? I said, I, you know, I think Jesus is good with orange tang in a tin cup. And so there we sat around. There were a group of people, the tribal people and some others. We sat around and we, and we passed the bread and we took the common cup around the circle. It was probably the most significant communion moment I can remember because at the end of the time, I said, why don't we stand up and join hands and sing? And I said, Steve, do they know Amazing Grace? He said, they do. Well, the wow language is an autonal language. I think it has like three tones. And so they were singing in wow and in Quechua, Spanish and English. You know, John Newton would have no idea 200 years prior when he penned the words to this song, uh, standing in a country that he didn't even know existed, that, um, we would be singing this song and it was so moving. And at the end of the time, um, you just felt like hugging somebody. And I turned to the Indian guy standing next to me and I just hugged him. And I realized that I was hugging Minkai, that I was hugging the man who speared his father, Nate, Steve Saint's father to death. Wow. And that next morning we're standing by the banks of the Kurai and Steve said, Minkai, why don't you tell Dick why you stopped killing people? And he said, well, when the ladies came and they brought the book that showed the new trails and the new markings, and we realized what those markings said, that God loved everybody and that we should not just kill them because they were different than we were, that's when we stopped. Mm. And um, it, it was just, it was just um, a wonderful moment. One thing that makes this particularly significant that we're doing this this evening is that, or this weekend, and that is that um, on April 28th, Minkai, who became the adopted grandfather of Steve Saint's family, one of Steve's grandsons is named Minkai. Uh, he, wow. he went to glory, as we would say, on April 28th. So mm -hmm. just a couple of weeks back. He was somewhere between 88 and 91. They weren't exactly sure. 13 children, 50 grandchildren, uh, scores of great-grandchildren, and he was the spiritual elder of the Warani tribe. So wow. to go from a 19-year-old killer to be the spiritual elder of a tribe some 60, 70 years later is just 
astounding, but it tells you what the blood of Jesus does. Yes, yes. From a from an upper room where they're celebrating the Passover, Jesus and his disciples to a beach in Ecuador to right now, Dick, all around the world. Uh, yes. We've got folks tuned in uh, at our online campus, and I don't know if it's going to be tang and cake, but uh, what <laughs> elements do you have uh, with you? I have a piece of sourdough bread with Kalamata, Kalamata, how do you say that, olives, from okay. the Great Harvest Bread Company in town. Yep. And I have some, the only thing I, with some unsweetened cranberry juice that makes you pucker when you drink it. And so I put a little sugar in it. <laughs> okay. The well, Lord Nick, you, <laughs> you know where I am. I'm above Ebenezer. So there well, there you go. I've, I've got a little bit of this good, good well, stuff. Um, those those beans are good. With two shots. And then is this okay, Dick, a sweet kolache? I, as soon as I learn to spell kolache, I'll tell you, but I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Well, listen, right now, as you're at home, if you would just collect those items, and well, we're not together physically, but we are together in spirit, yes, and uh, what a joy to be together as a spiritual family, as an extended family. Dick, maybe you can kind of lead us to the table, and I'll lead us out, and then we're going to sing another song together. Uh, our worship team is going to come and, and lead us, and I'll tell you a little bit about that but uh, I'll let you lead us to that communion table. So it was the night before the crucifixion and Jesus was with his disciples and he had done some serious talking with them about the things that counted. And he said, here's the thing, this is a fourth paraphrase. You need to love one another as I've loved you. And uh, greater love has no one than this, than one lays down one life, one's life for his friend. And he took the bread and he thanked the father for it and he passed it around. And uh, the idea of the bread, I think, has to do with the, with the needing and the, the um, connection that one has in the body of Christ. There is something that is a connection in the spirit that reaches from Jerusalem to the Rio Kurarai to Brussels, to Anchorage, to Washington, D.C., and to Windsor, Colorado. And uh, company means with bread, companies. And he passed the bread and said, all of you, take heed. This is my body given for you. Let's eat. It's a powerful thought about the needing, Dick. This week, my son Parker was home for a little bit, and uh, he made some biscuits, and he said, the number of times that you need it is the key to biscuits. I did not know this, uh -huh. but after I slapped some butter on them, I figured it out in a hurry. <laughs> and uh, you know what? I just, there's some people that are being needed right now, and it's a tough, tough season, but this. Just pray that you would receive the Lord's healing and strengthening and empowering in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after dinner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. When we take the cup, we're renewing the covenant that Christ made with us. And uh, we are not redeemed with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Wherever you are right now, let's take the cup together. Mm. Well, and I'm believing that this weekend, some of you have entered into that covenant relationship. Yep. And uh, we just want to say welcome to the family. And what a wonderful way to begin that relationship by yeah. celebrating communion together. Well, Dick, love you. Love Grateful you too. for you. And uh, we're going to send it back to the worship team. Uh, okay. We're about to sing a song that has tremendous 
uh, meaning for me. I shared the story of the Lord healing my asthma July 2nd, 2016. The very next weekend, July 9, we sing a song, Great Are You, Lord, and there's a line of lyrics that says it's your breath in my lungs, and it, Dick, it dropped me to my knees that week. Wow. I couldn't even stand wow. because I had this sense that the Lord had healed me. Yeah. And he had, here I am, 1,408 days later. And yeah. so as we worship together, w- would you make it your prayer? Would you just sing it with all the faith that you have? And let's believe God for some more miracles. Here we go.